men's basketball continued its dominance at Xfinity Center. Baseball and lacrosse are ramping up for another historic spring season. And we'll take a closer look at how some former Terps fared in the NFL this season. All that and more coming up on the left bench. Defensively, I thought we set the tone. It's not about us, it's about our teammates. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Left Bench presented by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Alex Gary, that's Kira Bruno, and Kira it's oh so good to be back. It is Alex, first time behind the desk here in Studio A this calendar year, but we're actually going to take this show right out into the field where Jonas Evans joins us from Xfinity Center following Maryland women's basketball's fifth straight win, a 87-66 victory over Penn State. Jonas, tell us more. Yeah, guys, well, you mentioned that uh, streak that they're on right now. The momentum, they carried it into this first quarter that they played against Penn State. They were rolling, playing super aggressively. The offense looked great. And I'm going to point to Abby Myers right away. 24 points. That is a season high. It was a game high. This offense looked incredible. You also look at Diamond Miller, who was a super impact, just going inside all the time. She got double teamed on almost every single drive that she took, kicking it out. And I'm going to give a, a ton of credit, too, to Brene Alexander, who was a lethal three-point shooter in this game. The offense looked really, really smooth, fluid. Synerg the synergy was there. And Coach Freeze's team, they had an inferior opponent at home, uh, and they just took care of business. And that's what great teams do, and it shows with this Terrapins team. And, Jonas, you talked a little bit about the offense there, but... When we think about the defense, Brenda Freeze said last game that she thinks the defense is what's winning the games right now. So what did you see tonight from the defensive side of their performance? Well, well, Kiara, Coach Freeze is, is exactly right, especially with the defense that we saw in the first half. They had eight turnovers in the first quarter. Uh, Penn State couldn't get the ball across um, the half-court line. Now, I will say it, it was a tale of two halves. The defense regressed a little bit, and I think that was the thing that uh, this team was most frustrated with themselves. It's over a 20-point win. They're happy with how they performed, but you know we're going to talk about this stretch in a sec. They, 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 they play really, really good teams, and then they come here against an inferior team. They want to play really good defense for all four quarters. It, they they, they kind of shied away from the intensity a little bit in the third quarter, brought it back in the fourth. I was really impressed with this defense. And um, Bree McDaniel, she played incredible um, off the bench. The intensity never lacked for this Terps team. Thank you so much, Jonas, for joining us. Yeah, thanks Maryland for having me. Maryland will next head over to Iowa for what should be an exciting top 10 matchup. Brenda Fries and her squad have won their last two conference games on the road, but they'll have to shut down one of the nation's top scorers in Caitlin Clark to extend that streak to three. That's right. Last season, the Terps were able to pull off an 81-69 win in Iowa City. The game will be played on Thursday at 8.30 p.m. And over to the men's team now, which continues to dominate at Xfinity. After getting revenge against Wisconsin Wednesday night, the Terps took on the Nebraska Cornhuskers, and the outcome didn't look much different. It was a back-and-forth battle between the teams until the last three minutes of the first half when a Don Carey three-pointer put the Terps up by 10. Carey was really feeling it from beyond the arc, going a perfect 4 of 4 from 3. Come the second half, it was the Terps all day long, spreading the ball in offense and staying aggressive defensively. Patrick Emelian had his best offensive performance of the year, notching seven rebounds and a season-high 10 points. Although Nebraska put up a balancing effort, it wasn't enough to get, get past Maryland's energy on both ends of the floor, leading to an 82-63 Terps win. I've kind of beat that dead horse, but it's... Um... You know, he got hurt Tennessee. He really couldn't play UCLA. And he sprained his ankle and was out for those four games. Um, he just gives us a different dynamic in the fact that um, we can switch pick and rolls. He can slide over to the power forward. He can slide over to the center. Um, he's, you know, he was a big key of why we got off to such a really good start. And for more on where the men's team stands right now at the midway point of the Big Ten season, we're happy to welcome back Sam Oshry and Ben Dixon, who cover the team for Testudo Times. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being here. It's great to be here. Thank you, guys. Now, let's get right into it. Uh, with one of the impact performers from Saturday's matchup, Don Carey, 
He's had a bit of an up and down season so far. He shot 100% from the three point arch and finished the game with 16 points. What does Carey need to do to ensure that he has more performances like this? Yeah, his play is a huge X factor of some sort, you know, given the fact that he came in as a 40 ish percent three point shooter and he's only shooting 30.8% from three this year. Um, the team's going to need him. The team's going to need him to have confidence due to partially the lack of options on the bench, as Willard said today, and, you know, partially that they're just going to need him to be that 40% three point shooter that they added to the roster. If he keeps shooting like that, they're going to win some games here. Yeah, Ben said X Factor, and that's exactly who he is to me. Like, I think that he's the most important player on the team moving forward. He's not the best, and he won't be the most impactful, but he's the most important to me just because of the shooting. Maryland's the second worst sh three-point shooting team in the Big Ten. If they're going to make a run to the top of the standings, a run in the Big Ten tournament, a run to the NCAA tournament, they need to improve their three-point percentage. And it starts with their best three-point shooter coming into the season, which is Don Carey. So if he can, can build on that Nebraska performance, build on it for tomorrow in Indiana, and then continue as the season goes on, they'll be in good shape. And all year long, this team has really struggled on the road. And with the last two wins at home, how important is it for them to close out their home stand on Tuesday against Indiana with a win when they're about to go back on the road? Yeah, they played, they played 10 games. The record's 5-5. Five and five. five wins at home, five losses on the road. So it, it doesn't speak more than that of, in terms of how good they are at home with a great crowd and great student section at the Xfinity Center every time they're playing at home. But when they go on the road, they're really struggling. And Willard said that they're he thinks they're rattled. And you can kind of see that, how they open the game against Purdue, against Michigan, against Rutgers, against all these teams. The first 10, 15 minutes of the game, they've shot the ball really poorly. They've gone away from their offensive identity of getting to the basket and limiting their three-point attempts. And when, when that happens, they struggle. But when they're at home, it's a completely different story. Exactly what Sam said. Look, the Xfinity Center is one of the best atmospheres in the entire country when it's rocking. It's not only the students, it's just the team feeds off it, off to better starts, shot selection is better just shooting the ball better in general. Um, it's tougher to do that on the road. Kevin Willard has beat that dead horse many times throughout the year. But I think with this three-game homestand, if those trends continue tomorrow against Indiana, it'll be easier uh, roads moving forward. Now, most bracketologists have the Terps either on or somewhere near the bubble of, uh, uh, for the NCAA tournament. What are the, we have 10 games left in the regular season, plus the, NC, uh, plus the Big Ten tournament. What do the Terps need to do to hear their names called on March 12th? Yeah, I think 10 and 10 in Big Ten play is the benchmark you're looking at. It's obviously different year by year, but when Maryland made it in the COVID season, they were only 9 and 11. Some 9 and 11 teams have gotten in. A lot of 10 and 10 teams have gotten in. And you want to avoid those bad losses too. Hold serve at home, so Indiana win tomorrow would be huge. And avoid losing to the Minnesotas, the Nebraskas moving forward. And I think this team should be in good shape if they finish 500 in conference play. Yeah, I completely agree. They have to go 10-10 in the conference. And a big part of that is because they had such a hard non-conference schedule. When you're looking at it, come Selection Sunday, they're going to have one of the hardest non-conference schedules in the country. With Tennessee, they played UCLA, Miami, St. Louis. Um, so when you're looking at that, that's a plus for Maryland to hear their name called on Selection Sunday. But they have to take care of home court, like Ben said. But their schedule really opens up. They play Northwestern. They play Minnesota twice. They're going to play Nebraska, Penn State twice. So they're playing teams that are towards the bottom of the Big, big Ten standings. But you have to win at home, and you have to win at least a couple on the road. And if they do, they should be in good shape come Selection Sunday. Yeah, you're certainly right on that. Well, Sam and Ben, thank you guys so much for coming on and chatting with us again, and good luck with the rest of your coverage for the season, and we'll see you in Chicago for the Big Ten Tournament. Thanks for thank having you. us. And you, when we come back, we'll talk about gymnastics and wrestling's action-packed weekend. And we'll take a look at what's in store for the three reigning Big Ten champs this spring. Don't go anywhere. Let's go see your room. There's so many rewards in life. You coming into our home was one of the greatest rewards we could have ever had. You know, it took 20 years and I got my third child who was 17 at the time. It's so cool to watch the adult that you've become and you really have done as much for us as you think we've done for you.
Welcome back to the left bench. Kira Bruno here alongside Alex Gary. And Alex, let's waste no time getting into the gymnastics team's home op nail biting home opener. Yeah, I practically don't have any nails left after that one. Maryland Gymnastics hosted Michigan State for a dual meet this weekend, and the Terps ended up dropping their first meet of the season, but it was a tight 196.95 to 196.425 affair. The team started off on vault, where Emma Silberman and Reese McClure brought home team high scores. They then competed on bars where many gymnasts posted strong scores to edge out the Spartans. The Terps were led by Sierra Kondo and Aleka Chiknius, scoring 9.9s for first place. Then Marilyn headed to beam, where Emma Silberman continued her strong showing. On the floor, Silberman completed her last routine, and she placed third in the all-around. Our bar lineup was outstanding, right? I mean, I just really think, you know, we've done pretty good bars the first two weeks, but this is when we, like, put it all together, and you could see that come through in the score. I mean, it's a really talented bars group. We knew when, when we hit it, it would be good, and, and today was a great day. The gymnastics team wasn't the only one to fall to the Spartans this weekend. Maryland Wrestling suffered a crushing loss to both Michigan State and Michigan during their weekend away. The Terps first took on the Spartans where Braxton Brown won his 18th match of the season and remains undefeated in dual matches. Jaron Smith successfully picked up his second pin but it wasn't enough to overcome MSU and Maryland took the loss 37-9. Two days later it was time for the Terps to take on number three Michigan. John Martin Best notched the first pin of his college career at 165, but with those key wrestlers missing, the Terps dropped this one 44-5. Maryland will return to the mat in College Park this Saturday against Rutgers, still searching for its first conference win. But Alex, wow, the Big Ten is just a gauntlet in gymnastics and wrestling. I mean, it doesn't matter the sport. The Big Ten is going to bring the competition regardless. That's right. While we're recapping all those actions from the two teams, we're very much anticipating the action for a few spring teams here in CP. And first and foremost, the defending national champion men's lacrosse team, a squad coming off one of the most dominant seasons in the sports history. The Hardshells finished last season with a perfect 18-0 record, which included six regular season wins over top 10 teams. The Terps eclipsed 20 goals seven times and easily secured both the regular season and MIG-10 tournament titles. They went on to beat the reigning champion Virginia Cavaliers in the NCAA tournament, followed by wins over Princeton and Cornell in the tournament semifinals and championship. Maryland will miss Tawarton winner Logan Wisnowskis and former NNL number one pick Jonathan Donville this year. But they return a stacked squad once again, including defensiveman Brett Makar, who will be donning jersey number one in 2023. Maryland, um, you know, it's our state sport. We have a lot of tradition. Um, you know, we, we kind of know that going into it. Uh, you know that when you, you kind of take this job. I think you know that when you decide to come here, uh, Maryland lacrosse, it, 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 it is what it is. So um, you have to kind of prepare for that every day. You got to be the best version of yourself every day. And, you know, it, after the kids took a little bit of a break last summer, it was back to work. Um, and all right, what we did last year was last year. This year is this year. After a devastating one-goal loss in the Final Four last season, Maryland women's lacrosse also has high expectation yet again in 2023. Six players have been named preseason All-Americans by USA Lacrosse Magazine. Emily Sterling and Abby Bosco lead the first team, followed by Shailene Ahern on the second, and Libby May and Hannah Lubecker were nominated for the third team. Kathy Reese brought in a colossal freshman class, with three players ranked on Inside Lacrosse Top 100 for the class of 2022. The MIDI trio of Corey Edmondson, Maggie Wiseman, and Jalen Roska come in at number one, four, and seven, respectfully. The Terps were tabbed at number two in Inside Lacrosse preseason ranking, which were released Monday morning. Maryland is only behind defending national champs North Carolina and are one spot ahead of Boston College, who knocked the Terps out of the NCAA tournament last year. They'll begin the season at their temporary home field, CQ Stadium, on February 11th versus St. Joseph's. The unique thing about this group, and I think this is actually going to be really special, really special for us. We've been spending a lot of time talking about being unselfish this season and how much any of the seven people on the field for us can score. And so our focus is really going to be what, what can we create for our teammates. It's not about us, it's about our teammates. And what can we do to set that up? And, you know, I think we have returners like Eloise Clevenger and, and Shay Ahern and Libby May and Hannah Lubecker and Shannon Smith. We have a lot of returners on the offense today. The anticipation just keeps growing stronger because the Maryland baseball season is right around the corner as well. 
The Dirty Terps are another team that made its mark in College Park last season with numerous historic moments, like Ryan Ramsey's perfect game on April 29th. Fans should be gearing up for another exciting season at the Bob. Maryland is ranked in the top 25 of pretty much every preseason poll. With standout players like Jason Sabacool and Matt Shaw remaining on the roster and some new faces like Matt Woods and Elijah Lambros, the Terps are the favorites to win the Big Ten for the second straight year. They'll begin their season on February 17th against South Florida and will be back in College Park on February 21st for their home opener against West Virginia. Here's head coach Rob, Va Rob Vaughn with an outlook on the 2023 season. Really exciting about two weeks. Right now we got a lot of work to do. You know, I think we're we get the right people. I think they're working really hard. They're, we got great leadership and a lot of experience, which is huge. Um, we're not ready yet, but in two weeks we will be. So I think it's if we had a good week in a first in the first weekend of practice, good scrimmages. And when we come back, Andrew McBride will be here to tell you how some former Terps performed in the NFL this season. And later we'll crown our Terp of the Week, Pro Terp, in our top five plays. Keep it right here. I tell my son, I love you every single day. I love you. Now my dad has never said that to me. Not because he doesn't love me, but because culturally it wasn't comfortable for him. Now that he's a grandfather, he says I love you to my son every time he sees him. My advice to all the fathers out there, forget the cultural restrictions. They grow up way too fast for you to waste even a single precious moment. House it's looking pretty cool so far. A place that I call home. I'm teaching Louise how to cook some lasagna. You don't need to respond to make a fire start. Thank you. Study, please. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. Welcome back once again to the Left Bench presented by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Alex Gary here with Kira Bruno. And Kira, we just came off an exciting championship Sunday where my Philadelphia Eagles and the Chiefs are headed to the Super Bowl. Yeah, and Alex, just like you're excited, it seemed like the Empire State Building was also excited, but unfortunately there were no Terp alumni in, on, in any of the games on Sunday. But the season as a whole featured many memorable moments for some former Terps. Andrew McBride joins us in the studio with more. Yeah, guys, rookie or veteran, these guys represented the black and gold very well on NFL Sundays this year. It wasn't that long ago that Chico Conco was running through defenders and scoring touchdowns in College Park. But this year, he did it as a member of the Tennessee Titans. Chico Conco was a pleasant surprise for the Titans this season and seemed to have a bright future. The fourth round pick completely shattered expectations placed on him before the season, something he's used to doing, since he was only a three-star out of high school and barely shined until last season at Maryland. Chico made 32 receptions for 450 yards in eight starts this year, including three touchdowns. Chig's season really skyrocketed in week nine. From that week on, he put up 30 plus yards in every game except one. Okonko is set to have an increased role during the 2023 season, and Tennessee may have found a future weapon in the Maryland alum. This next guy has been killing it in the league since he arrived, and that did not change this season. I'm talking about Stefan Diggs. Diggs continued his superstar career as he once again thrived this season by virtue of his unmatched chemistry with Josh Allen. 
Diggs recorded 108 receptions, 1,429 yards, and 11 touchdowns in the regular season. It was the fifth year in a row that he's eclipsed 1,000 yards in a season, and he continues to prove why he's a perennial top five receiver in the NFL. His season had his woes, however, because the Bills were bounced out of the playoffs in the divisional round, earlier than Diggs may have hoped, evident by his viral outcry towards Josh Allen on the sideline. Diggs will likely continue his greatness next season, and he'll hope to be a reason the Bills make a deeper run in the playoffs next year. Our next player definitely did not meet expectations that were placed on him after flashing an absurd amount of potential early on in his career. Darno Savage, unlike the last two Terps, had a fairly disappointing season after showing great promise in his first three seasons. Savage, a former first round pick, only had one interception. This pick six that helped him boost the Packers to a much needed win over divisional rival Minnesota Vikings and highlighted his quiet season. Savage also racked up 58 tackles and one fumble recovery, but he was demoted twice this season from the starting corner to the dime spot. He's now looking at a prove it year next year to save his job. This last former Terp season was mostly taken out of his hands because of his sporting cast, but he still managed to produce. That's DJ Moore. Moore also had a fairly frustrating season after dealing with shaky quarterback play all season, bouncing from Sam Darnold to Baker Mayfield, PJ Walker, and even Jacob Eason. Despite the struggles, Moore still put up 63 receptions, 888 yards, and seven touchdowns. This season was the first time the Panthers' standout did not surpass 1,000 yards receiving since his rookie season in 2018. Moore's season, like Diggs, also consisted of a bad moment going viral when he cost the Panthers the game in week eight after his excessive celebration following a jaw-dropping Hail Mary to tie the game. The penalty caused the Panthers to miss the extra point and eventually lose in overtime. Moore is one decent quarterback away from getting back on track and putting up 1,000 yard season again. And guys, next year, let's hope you're talking about the great seasons that Jalen Duncan and Deontay Banks had in their rookie years. Yeah, Andrew, you're right on that. Both players made a huge impact in the Maryland uniform and hopefully in NFL seasons too. And everyone always talks about, you know, Bama and Georgia uh, producing these talents. Maryland produces some talents too. Just saying. Yep. All right, and it's about that time we crown our Terp of the Week. This player isn't new to the crown, but we couldn't help but choose him again after his stellar performance this past weekend. It's Jameer Young. Young has been unstoppable ever since coming to College Park, leading Maryland in points per game, just as Alex predicted back in November. He notched 18 points against Nebraska, was 9 of 9 from the free throw line, tallied a game-high 7 assists, and grabbed 6 steals. Talk about a guy who can do it all. Oh, and we just can't forget about that un unbelievable three for the win against Illinois. Yeah, that's right, we're still talking about it. Congrats, Shamir, on being crowned our Terp of the Week yet again. This week's Pro Terp happens to be one of the best scorers on a team that's turning heads in the NBA. We're talking about the Red Mamba himself, Kevin Herter. Ever since his move to Sacramento, Herter has been a certified bucket for the Kings. He led all scorers with 21 points last Wednesday in a loss to the Raptors. Herter put up 11 against the Timberwolves on Saturday as his clutch shooting from behind the arc kept the Kings in the game throughout. Herter is known as a three-point specialist, which has led to some rumors of his inclusion in the All-Star Game three-point contest. We'll have to wait and see about that, but congrats to Kevin on being named our Pro Turf this week. We had some show-stopping plays this weekend, so let's not wait any longer. Kira, take it away. All right, starting us off in at number five is this Lavender Briggs three-pointer. It was only three points of her 14 points on the night. Look at this again in slow-mo, bam, beautiful bucket by Briggs. And for number four, we have Jameer Young with the hustle and the block, sending it off the back of the basket. And oh my God, what a hit onto the glass. Next up, we have another play from women's basketball against Michigan. This time it's none other than Diamond Miller. Look at this layup right here. 23 points on the night she had. Look at that. And for number two, we take it to Xfinity with Alexis Rubio hitting this insane flip off the beam. Oh, amazing work from Rubio. And in at number one is this alley oop from Jameer Young. Huge dunk by Dante Scott. I feel like I have to be silent for this one. Just look at that again. Amazing. And that's going to do it for the first episode of The Left Bench here in 2023. But don't worry, we'll be pumping out content all spring, starting with our Wrestling In Focus show on Thursday. Ben Wolf and Sam Jane will have you covered for that. And be sure to keep up with us on Terrapin Sports Central. 
coverage on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and online at TerrapinSportsCentral.com. We'll see you next time.